Uh, welcome to CORAL's OER Hangout. My name is Carl Blythe and uh, I'm the director of CORAL and we'll be moderating our Hangout today. Uh, we have four speakers, Sonia Mbalak from uh, Eastern Mennonite University in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Uh, Maggie Berti from the University of Arizona, Tucson. Julie Hammock also from University of Arizona, Tucson and David Thompson, professor of Spanish from Luther College. Um, so two people in Spanish, uh, one in Italian and one in ESL. So we're t talking about different levels and different languages. Um, so the, the topic today is of course the impact of OER on teaching. And I've had a, a little chance to talk to uh, the presenters and to, to tell them a little bit about what I think the title means, but they it's open. They can talk about whatever is really on their mind and we're going to have a very informal conversation and have plenty of time for some back and forth, uh, some Q and a afterwards. But what, um, what we were intending by impact is when people start using OER, there's actually been research on how OER begins to affect teacher cognition. That is how teachers understand their role, what it is that they do. And oftentimes uh, teachers think of themselves as classroom practitioners and their job is to use somebody else's pedagogical materials. So textbooks that are produced by a, a commercial publishing company, they don't produce them, somebody else does and they use them in the classroom. But things are changing and people are realizing with the internet and with multimedia tools, platforms becoming easier to use that we do have the power to actually produce pretty good materials. And sometimes those materials are actually better than commercial uh, products because they are more current um, and we're able to localize them. And that's really one of the whole points of o the OER movement is that it gives people the power because of copyright issues, they can create their own materials that suit their students' needs. Um, but in addition to that, um, OER can have an impact on teachers in many different ways. And the research has also shown that that's the, um, the teachers who start to use materials and develop materials become um, open to other different kinds of pedagogies. Because essentially people in open education form this social network and they start to teach each other. So when somebody who wants to learn how to use a certain kind of technology, typically they'll start to ask around, they find that out and suddenly they are not just building an OER, but they're building their own social network about OER. So gradually people who develop OERs become over time open educators. And I think today, I hope our speakers will talk a little bit about that. Have they gone through this identity shift at all? Do they identify themselves as open educators now? Um, okay, so uh, the other thing I wanna mention before we uh, jump into our presentations is that Coral has just published an OER course. You can find it by going to our, uh, our, the, um, and our the, um, the splash page, the first page you come to on our website. There's on the pull down menu, there's OER or open education click on that tab and you'll, you'll find it under all these links for open education. Um, so it contains information about finding and searching for open educational resources or open content. Um, lots of facts about um, how to use, how to, how to interpret the CC licenses, all the different kinds of licenses and how to put them together and so forth. So it's much more extensive than what we do in, in an OER hangout. But today we're just gonna focus on one topic and that of course is the impact of OER on teaching. Um, so you can ask questions or make comments by typing in the chat. There's a chat function here in Zoom. Um, I think it might get, get a little complicated if people start speaking into their microphone. So I think it would be better actually if you just ask a question on chat. Um, and the way we've decided to go about this is that we're gonna give the speakers about oh, five, five, six minutes to talk about their uh, personal experience with OER and how OER has changed them. And then we will have a, a good half hour for questions, Q and A. Okay, so let me begin. Uh, I think Maggie will be up first. Maggie teaches again uh, Italian at the University of Arizona and she's been working on video, um, well, VR, virtual reality videos. So Maggie, take it away, it's yours. 
Okay, thank you. So hi everyone, my name is Marie Berti. I'm a PhD student uh, at the University of Arizona. I teach beginner and intermediate Italian courses and I've been a language educator for almost four years now. And I first learned about open educational resources during my master degree in a cold course, so computer assisted language learning. And then when I started my PhD, I also learned about virtual reality and it clicked uh, for me to think about how we can use virtual reality as open educational resources with students because in virtual reality you're able to experience environments that are not accessible due to financial or geographical reasons. And so what I did, I developed this platform called Italian Open Education where I put various videos that I recorded in Italy in virtual reality and I had students use these videos um, in an out-of-class activity to really experience the Italian culture in a different way. And when I think about the materials that we use with students, the language textbooks, they are so expensive. So I am from Italy and in Italy education is much uh, cheaper compared to the United States. Um, also from a materials point of view. And here, for example, the Italian textbook is 200 to $300. And it just becomes very demanding for students, very expensive, and they might not be able to take courses because of the cost of materials. And so with my open educational resources, virtual reality videos, I really wanted to help students experience and learn about the Italian language and the Italian culture in a different way and in a free way that uh, they might not be able to experience otherwise unless they really travel to Italy and study abroad. And the videos that I created um, were uploaded to YouTube under a Creative Commons license, a share alike license. And so this means that other educators can use these videos with their own students and adapt them to the needs of their students. And by creating this platform and sharing this video on YouTube, I also was able to reach out to other educators. So for example, I was contacted by a professor at the university, uh, at the Southern Oregon University, who um, decided to pretty much model what I did for Spanish learners. So she's going to do the same thing. She's going to record virtual reality videos in Southern America, and then she plans to um, share them online as of educational resources so that other Spanish instructors can use both with their students. And I also um, was able to get in touch with the Center uh, for English as a Second Language and my institution at the University of Arizona. And I spoke with them about what I've been doing with VR and OER. And so really the impact that open education had on me as an educator was to think about how we can support students in their, in their education and reduce the cost of materials for them and really how we can also reach out to more people and connect with other people who might have the same beliefs as I do uh, about education and about education being free for people or at least cheaper than what it currently is in the United States, maybe starting from a material standpoint. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that was again Maggie. Um, and Maggie teaches Italian at Matt, Maggie Berti at uh, Arizona. And so next up, uh, let me ask Julie Hammock, also from Arizona. She teaches it. it no, uh, go on to, to Maggie uh, from Arizona ESL. Okay, Maggie, oh, excuse me, excuse me, J Julie, sorry. <laughs> Hi there. Uh, yeah, actually, um, I'm glad that there are a couple of us from the University of Arizona here today because I think one of the central experiences to to this whole um, joining the OER movement, I guess, is that we kind of became part of the campus community in a way that I feel like I wasn't before because, you know, Maggie mentioned uh, she had come and talked to us about VR 
at the Center for English as a Second Language. Our OER librarian is, is here today, Cheryl Coolier, who was really helpful uh, when we were starting out our project. But uh, to back up, um, I'm the Instructional Design and Development Coordinator at the Center for English as a Second Language, and we're developing our own instructional materials, our own curricular materials for all of our classes, with the exception of grammar. And this has been, we've been working on this about a year. We started with OER because we needed, uh, we were looking for materials that we could um, design to the needs of our students, that we could adapt the way we needed to. Um, and we came across the, the concept of open education uh, as part of a grant that we were writing for another project. And we didn't get the grant, but we did learn about OER. And then I think we've, we've uh, kind of exploded from there. So. Um, what we're doing is developing textbook. We're doing them in the forms of chapters. Um, we're developing for, from levels A1 up to B1. Um, so we've got about 20 courses that we de developed chapters for and we're piloting those right now. Um, what I'll do is I'll send out in the chat a link to some of the samples of what we've been developing. But this is a faculty project. So although we started out with a few people doing a lot of the development of the initial materials, you know, some people who have with a lot of experience in a particular area of teaching language, uh, we've moved on to have all of our faculty uh, developing chapters and developing other materials. And it's been a le learning experience. It's, I kind of moved into instructional design about five years ago with um, a cohort of my colleagues and we went through the process of, you know, deciding, okay, now that we're in control of the materials that we're going to have, um, what are the possibilities? You know, what can we make and what do we want to do? Because once we moved away from having a commercial textbook chapter or, or a textbook that we were, you know, asked to be to use, uh, it opened it up to doing things like what Maggie said with VR. And we're actually we're working with another unit on our campus to pilot a VR project and that's in development right now. But um, it is kind of a different mindset, I think, mm -hmm. from being a classroom educator. And I started out teaching in elementary school in El Paso. And so uh, my first, the first time I walked into a classroom, I had a, a classroom teacher mentor and she opened up her file cabinet and said, okay, he's, the, here are the things that I've developed over the years and they're for you, you know, take them and use them. And so even though we don't, I didn't consider myself to be a materials developer when I started my, my position, I was. And all instructors, I think, are because, you know, we, we develop what we know our students are going to need. So, and I think it's a matter of making a leap from that to um, actually developing things that other people are going to be using because then you kind of, uh, you know, people are, Taking your work, you have to consider the way that other people teach, consider you know the, the expectations that other instructors might have for the materials that they're using. So one of my roles has been to uh, help our faculty um, move through this learning curve the way that we did. Um, and the first step on that was to understand what OER actually are. And so uh, we learned that as part of the grant that we were writing. And now we, um, we're trying to teach about what the licenses will allow us to do and why is that important? Why is it important that we're able to remix things or adapt things? And in our field, that's really important because um, if we're adapting for students who do not have the language proficiency that would allow them to use the original materials, you know, we've got some work on adaptation to do, mm -hmm. which you can't really do with uh, commercial materials without, you know, a little bit of uh, work, I guess you'd say. Um, and also the remixing. So when we were, we were developing our chapters, a lot of them involved uh, remixing things from a lot of different sources, including things that were not instructional, like blog posts, uh, podcasts. Um, and so we had to learn, you know, what are the, you know, the intricacies of these licenses? Um, what does it mean if something is, um, has an essay condition on it, you know, and we're still kind of wrestling with that because once you start remixing and you have a few things with the different essay licenses on them, you've got, um, you know, a puzzle about how you're going to license the only, the material that you're going to develop. But at any rate, um, we've, we're about a year in, we're piloting our materials now. Um, the instructors who developed, some of them have, you know, really felt that it was a 
positive professional development experience for them. I think for me, it helps me to kind of reflect on, you know, my goals as a teacher. And I like, what are the possibilities for doing something like vocabulary, right? There's a standard way that vocabulary appears in a lot of textbooks, but once you're able to control, you know, what it looks like and, you know, you're able to control how you approach that, those learning objectives too. So um, it's been a lot of exploration for us, um, a lot of training for our teachers. Um, I'm not sure what else to share, except that, you know, I appreciate Maggie uh, being willing to come out and work with us on the VR that she's working on. You know, we've started that as a result. Uh, Cheryl's been very important, Cheryl Collier, because, you know, without her, we wouldn't know what we know now about OER. And there's a lot of questions, a lot of advice involved. Um, and also uh, the other units that are working with us, like the Center for Digital Humanities, who's helping us on the VR. And just because, because of this project of, you know, all of a sudden we're in control of the materials that we're going to be using, we've kind of expanded across campus to all these other places we've reached out and, you know, we've been really mentored in a really important way. Great. Okay, thank you so much. Um, okay, just to remind you, that's Julie from University of Arizona. And before that, that was Maggie also from Arizona. And I think there's a theme going on here that as you're working on OERs, you develop then this kind of social network. And we already see that developing at the U of A. That's pretty cool. Okay, so next up, let's hear from David. David at Luther College who teaches Spanish. Hi everyone, my name is uh, David Thompson and I teach uh, Spanish at Luther College in Northeast Iowa. It's a small liberal arts college. Um, my project uh, related to OER started uh, last year uh, during a sabbatical leave. Um, I was looking for a way to involve students in upper level courses in Spanish in more inquiry based learning. Um, I wanted them to um, work on case studies or contemporary problems uh, that would require them to do research um, to uh, examine that case study or problem um, and work in small teams collaboratively to propose solutions uh, to those problems. Uh, and so what I did is I developed a series uh, of problem-based learning units for advanced students of Spanish and made them available um, with the Creative Commons license online. Uh, so the materials that I developed were are an example of OER, but I was also using uh, open resources uh, as part of the development. Um, so the four units, uh, uh, first one has to do with the uh, Mosque the Cathedral of Cordoba in southern Spain. Uh, the second has to do with uh, bullfighting, that tradition in Spain. Uh, the third one with uh, African immigration to Spain, and the final one with uh, Catalonian secession and independence. Uh, so each of those units begins with a short text, uh, usually a letter or a memo um, that reveals the, a conflict or a problem, but that doesn't define it for the students. It's up to the students working together in their teams uh, to define the problem, to do a little bit of initial research and propose a definition. And then after that, to work through a, an iterative uh, process of um, doing the research to define uh, key terms and locate institutions and uh, to uh, develop their knowledge of the uh, context. Uh, before uh, then proposing a solution. And they do that in both, both in writing and uh, through an oral presentation. Uh, so one of my goals for the units was to have students working with uh, authentic uh, text in Spanish, uh, both electronic and print. Um, but I didn't want those resources to be highly curated or edited. Um, part of the goal of um, problem-based learning is to present students with um, messy or incomplete information that they must then combine and recombine uh, in order to uh, develop a reasonable solution. And so this is one aspect of OER that I think um, dovetails well with uh, instructional methods like problem-based learning. Uh, and that's that OER lends itself well to being uh, sort of less curated or edited uh, for a classroom context. And so can be beneficial for staging those uh, ill-structured problems uh, that require students to define issues and locate new information, evaluate and synthesize that information, and then propose solutions. Uh, the, for me, uh, for my project last year, I think the underlying question was, um, 
what kind of teaching and learning activities are most productive uh, to moving advanced students of Spanish toward my program's um, highest objectives, especially the ability to conduct independent research uh, on significant disciplinary questions. And so uh, deciding to work with and, and develop uh, open resources uh, offered me the freedom to explore inquiry-based learning as a means of moving students uh, toward what matters to me and my colleagues uh, most. Uh, more independent, more self-directed learning, uh, more collaborative problem solving, um, analytical reasoning, and then effective communication as well. Uh, so developing and using OER helped me uh, to focus more on my highest goals for students, and that's something that I've heard um, uh, my colleagues uh, earlier uh, talk about. Uh, it's helped me to adapt uh, resources to goals that we have uh, at my institution. Uh, it's helped me to think about course design more intentionally uh, and about moving away from some of the more curated or highly edited um, uh, classroom resources. Um, and, and as I said, it's, it's I think helped me develop um, uh, sort of units of learning that are perhaps more like the kinds of problems that my students will encounter uh, after graduation. Okay, thank, thank you very much. That was really interesting, this, uh, the idea of ill-defined units of learning and not, not overly curated, which I guess is uh, what's reflected in most commercial materials. Okay, last but not least, we have Sonia. Okay, from um, Sonia, you're gonna tell us a little bit about the, the, Spanish, the Spanish OER that you've developed at Eastern Mennonite University. Thank you so much, Card, and uh, a pleasure to be again with my family, core family, of course. And uh, yeah, my name is Sonia Balash, and currently I am teaching Spanish and linguistics at Eastern Mennonite University um, in Harrisonburg, Virginia. And uh, I already have the wonderful experience of creating OER materials when I was teaching at George Mason University. And we had a collaborative project. Uh, we were four professors teaching there and uh, we created the Spanish and culture in context that is already online in the portal of the uh, University of Austin, Corel. And uh, let's say that was the the beginning of an uh, amazing and wonderful experience um, because um, not just that I learned by myself uh, to see, uh, like, to have a, a better insight what I, what I was as an instructor, what I was using as an instructor, what were the objectives that I have in my courses. N not just that, also my, I would say that my core syllabus nowadays, I can say that are richer than before. And this is in part because it's not just, when I started with this experience, I used to say, okay, I am creating free teaching materials. But nowadays I would say, no, I, I am creating more than that. I am creating uh, uh, materials that are challenging that are interesting, that are, are materials that are, are mirroring the, the current events that we have nowadays in a critical way, because it's not that I want that my students or any student see the, the events as I see them, but in a critical way, making very interesting questions. And I can say that I have been uh, pleased uh, to see that not just my students, but students of other colleagues have used those materials. Even colleagues that I don't, I have never met, but they sent emails saying, wow, this song have critical observations. And hey, we think that, but it's, it's, that's the idea that we are not creating something that is perfect, but something that it, it would be better every time that a student or a, or a colleague read our materials or use our materials. Also, I would say that thanks to the creation of OER materials, I can say that I am putting in practice 
all what I have learned for many years in the academia. I have reading and reading how to put that in practice. So uh, when you are writing, when you are writing for this big audience of students, you have to be very careful with your syntax, with the vocabulary that you are using. So all that is very, uh, very learning process for me. And also, um, I would say that in, in, in many ways, I am mentoring other colleagues uh, about how to approach certain topics. And uh, so uh, going back to my uh, core syllabus, I incorporate more and more readings that I write specifically for those topics that I am creating. That I, for example, now, right now I am creating a new course that is uh, Flavors of Hispanic Culture. And uh, why? Because in my university that uh, the, the, the social justice is a very main topic, talking about social justice. So talking about food, how food and culture goes along the history and how the big companies are using food to a little bit uh, eliminate the specific needs of the, of. So those topics, we don't have it in textbooks and I have the freedom to write about that. Always questioning, questioning and taking both sides. So I would say that writing OER materials make me a better instructor. All right, thank you That's so much, Sonia. No, I want I, to take the time of my colleagues, yeah. <laughs> really interesting, all four of you. Um, and it strikes me that um, uh, all four of you then are very much involved in the production of OER, in the development of OER, but it doesn't necessarily start there. Some people, when they, when they are first kind of looking around, they begin by consuming OER. Somebody has made an OER and that they find it and they start to use it. And then your wheels begin to turn. Well, how did I do, how did that happen? So yeah, I, I don't want people to think that you have to right away become an OER developer. You can find OER out there and start to use it. And then that might make you inspired to try some of these things, just like, like Maggie was inspired at some moment to go ahead and try virtual reality video, even though she didn't have a lot of, of experience in that area. So, okay, we have time now, I said for about 30 minutes for our 20 minutes for a Q and A. So um, I'm gonna let people post their questions in the chat, but I'm gonna start with my own question. I, I had, um, there, I have way too many questions here, but I, I wanted to, um, ask you a very general question to everybody. Getting started, what was your biggest obstacle, do you think? What is your biggest obstacle in getting started and working on these OER projects? And you all have kind of different ones, but if we could just hear from, go ahead, in Sonia. My, okay, in my case, in my case, uh, when I started doing this uh, amazing adventure, it was selecting the specific topics I was going to write about. Mm -hmm. That was the, 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 the key problem that, I, that we, as a group, we had to solve when we started with the uh, project um, with my colleagues, with the Spanish culture in context. The topics, selecting the topics. And that was the, the, the but nowadays, that is not a problem at all. I can see it. Let me see, I can see it, okay, this is a topic that is important and I need to write about that and uh, I need to read about that. I am not saying that I am the first one, first one writing about, I need to read a lot about that, but I say that I can pick the topic and, I, and then the, 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 once I have the topic is putting all the ideas together and because we are an example for our students, making, uh, doing the right references, indicating where is the source of every component. That, but but the, the big problem that we had when we started was selecting the topics. Uh, so one of the things I want to say about that is oftentimes we have people who want to work with us on different projects. And 
from the commercial publishing world, they often start these kinds of projects with what they call a scope and sequence. So you have to have everything all laid out. But again, in the open, this is somebody used the word mind shift. It's a different paradigm. So now it sounds like you, it's easier for you because you don't have to have everything all laid out. You can start with a good topic that you know people are talking about at your institution and you just keep building. So OER is a little bit, just jump in and keep building and keep building and keep building. Okay, um, so let me ask David, throw that to David, your biggest obstacle. Well, I, I agree with Sonia that um, I think, you know, the big picture for me was uh, a, a bit of a challenge, but I think that, uh, like you said, Carl, that one of the things that I found myself doing was moving, uh, shifting often between big picture and development of particular uh, materials. So this constant sort of back and forth, and then over time, those things would shape each other. So the decisions yeah. that I was making about particular uh, units or ask particular materials that I wanted to use would shape the big picture and then the big picture would intervene and, and cause me to make a decision about uh, particular materials. So um, I, I appreciated that. It's it's definitely a process that required patience on, on my part and um, um, it was helpful to get feedback uh, from colleagues about the, you know, the design that I was attempting to do and um, like um, uh, Sonia and others have said, um, you know, uh, getting that feedback from your community of um, uh, colleagues and educators uh, is, is one of the things that I value most about the project and about open resources. Great. Okay. And Julie, I think we're just going to go in backward order there. Julie, what about you? I think I agree with Sonia also. Um, it's kind of a complex thing, you know, when you're starting out a new unit or a chapter or a topic. You know, you need to choose the topic, you need to choose your instructional objectives, and then you also need to consider what's available to me as far as OER goes. Um, and any one of those can affect the other two, right? So if I want to do a unit on, for example, I don't know, intellectual property. So how am I going to, you know, what instructional objectives do I have? Um, what kinds of materials do I need? And then I need to go out to the OER and find something that's openly licensed or many things. And then, um, See, do I have anything there that I'm going to be able to, you know, shape into to something helpful, right? And possibly I won't, so I've got to go back and I've got to kind of reimagine my objectives and my topic. And so it's kind of a constant back and forth, but I like also the idea that it's not, I guess you'd say, deterministic. Like, so what I start out with is not necessarily where I'm going to end up as far as what my final chapter is going to look like. And it does depend on things like what's available. Um, you know, once you've got the empowerment to create your instructional, you know, experiences the way you want to, the opportunities are huge. So how do you narrow those down? And so it does kind of evolve over time and it doesn't really look like what you would have expected at the beginning. And so I think that that complexity was one of the challenges for me. And I think some of my colleagues also. Mm -hmm. That's a good word is complexity and dynamic and evolving over time. Okay. And then finally, Ma Maggie, what was your biggest obstacle when you started out? Yeah. So for me, I actually started to use OER in an ESI course that I was teaching and I didn't produce any. I was just using those online on the Merlot website. And an obstacle that I had on there was really to find the resources that were open educational resources because there were so many materials on the website and some of them were not OER. And so it was kind of difficult to navigate and really understand which one were open and I could use with my students. As a creator um, of these VR videos, an obstacle that I had was really to understand how I could share these videos as OER online because it's not a traditional PDF where you can just put the license there. It, was, it felt kind of different with the video. How can I really make sure that users understand that it's open and they can use it? with right. their students. And so um, I really had to dig deeper into that. And then I found out that on YouTube, uh, there is a possibility to list videos with a Creative Commons license, share alike. And so then I was able to get over the obstacle and just upload them on that and then gather them on the Italian Open Education website. Mm -hmm. It's interesting how so many people's obstacles are, I just didn't know. And then you've, 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 
look for that knowledge somewhere on the internet and you, you figure it's a, whether it's the license or how to put the license on or okay um uh, so we have some questions if i if i could read those back um first of all um have any of the presenters tasked students with creating their own oer we're actually discussing that right now uh so we do want to kind of have either student, you know, sample work embedded, but we also talked kind of recently about having um, students actually develop some of these instructional experiences. So one thing that came up in a meeting about the VR things we're doing um, is that students could do, you know, these nonlinear stories um, using something called Twine, which is just basically a nonlinear story generator, I guess you would call it openly licensed, um, but having the students create these experiences and then building on those and, you know, kind of having it snowball forward to be used with students in, you know, classes in the future. So, yeah, we, we're talking about, you know, how to get student permission to do that, um, you know, what are the, you know, niceties involved with that. Anybody else want to share their experience? I've, I've not asked to create OER per se, but I often do ask students for permission to share their work. So for example, if I have students that are creating solutions to problems that I've posed uh, in, in my project, then um, I ask for individuals or teams to allow me to share those with a, a future a class or future group of students. I noticed that somebody posted. You, you're on mute. I noticed also that uh, in the chat room that somebody posted a re related question. Have any of you developed your materials so that they can be added on or supplemented by others? So that, I don't know if you're asking an open-ended question and then people can then kind of add, you've, you've designed your materials in such a way that users can generate and can add on easily to that, that OER. That's an interesting another design feature that's often true found in some of these OER courses. Anybody experimented with that? Uh, yes. And in um, last semester, teaching a new course, and I, with the readings that I wrote, it was part of the activities, uh, the assessment um, uh, for my students to comment or uh, suggest information that, they sh that I should add or why. So they should write in, in a very specific way. I, this specific topic needs this or this or this or that for this or that, and that was part of the evaluation. So it, it was important that um, I, was, I, ha I kept a log with all that information. So those readings are changing for the new semester in one year. That is a class that I will teach in one year. And it's Spanish of, of the US. And we were questioning is this of the US or in the US? And our student, undergraduate students, because there are courses about that for graduate students. This was designed for undergraduate students. And so definitely my readings will be better thanks to my students. And, uh, and uh, they are incorporated with the specific names and giving, uh, I got authorization for that, yes. Okay. Because that's the idea, that's the idea. We don't have the final word on anything. That's the idea. Right. And that's why OER um, is very interesting because it's open, it's flexible. It, it, will be, it, it will be growing and it will be improving. Those materials will be improving. That's the idea. Mm -hmm. right, I haven't I think, done that, but I, oops. I think, as you said, Sonia, one of the points of OER is really to build on each other and really to use these materials and tailor them to our students. And so what I would like to do with my videos is to develop some activities and then leave them open for instructors to tailor these activities that go along with the videos and then tell them to their students and to their classrooms. I think that question that you read, Carl, was actually a follow-up question uh, from um, somebody asking first, where can 
where can I house materials mm -hmm. or where do you house your materials? Or do you, do you get that space um, handed to you by the, your institution basically? Or do you, uh, and then a lot of people responded in the chat and said, um, well, we're using Google Docs and um, we're using uh, OER Commons. What, what do the presenters do? So for me, I hosted my videos on YouTube and then I developed my own WordPress website. That's what I did. But I think it would be great to host it through the university as well to reach more people. So the, the platform for my units is just a Google site, um, a website uh, through Google and my institution does uh, uh, subscribe to or, or um, uh, purchase a license for Google Suite. Um, I, I don't think that's required, uh, but um, that's that's the simple platform that I decided to use mostly because it is relatively simple to use. That, as I indicated before, the first part of our materials are in the Corel platform and uh, the ones that the new ones that I have created are in the Google side, but I hope they will migrate to Corel as well. The best platform, the well designed, the organization. So it's very appealing uh, that we have those materials there. And, uh what we're doing is developing um, a repository. So we've got our materials hosted on Box at the moment. And what we're doing is creating a tool that will allow not only our instructors to access materials in Box according to um, language level or according to skill, um, but also we're gonna open that to the public so that other people will be able to use the search tool to find their materials in the same way. Great. Yeah. So any, any platform really that allows for sharing um, uh, that is accessible online, of course, uh, but mostly also allows for sharing is, of course, great for OER. Um, next question comes from John Perkins. Um, he's asking uh, about, he, he's not really sure about uh, authentic materials um, because a lot of them are copyrighted. I think that was the, the problem. Um, and he's asking Sonia, do you consider your materials that you're creating authentic? And then in, in general, is anything that a native speaker creates authentic? <laughs> That's a beautiful question. <laughs> yes, I would say they are authentic. And not just that, they, um, they acknowledge previous studies, previous readings, previous research, and uh, I don't know, but every time you as a writer, as a creator, you are creating something that is new um, yeah, because you are doing the, some insights that other a different writer won't, won't have or maybe we have in a different way. Uh, that's why I insist that they are authentic and they are welcome to improve, to, to, to grow and to get better thanks to observations of other colleagues or my students. Um, yes, they are authentic, yes. <laughs> okay, um, so we're going back, uh, just wanted to go back to the previous question because uh, we, we had a follow-up question again about the, the platforms. Sonia had said that she is sharing her materials on the Coral platform. So what we are is actually just a website and we're linking to her Google Docs. That's basically what it is. Yeah. And a lot of those places where you can upload materials, of course you can upload the materials directly too, but a lot of them share just the links. So it's, it's really just a, um, uh, it, it's, it's just a, an, a link aggregator or materials aggregator where okay. you, uh, can find materials and a search with a really good search um, that's what it is or an organization that makes it easy to find things mm -hmm. um, yes uh, I actually had some questions too myself um, and I wanted to know uh, if if you have seen any Im improvements in engagement from the students since since you started implementing the materials uh, if their grades had improved if you've seen in general a change in your classroom um, 
are you feeling more engaged with your with your colleagues? Do you share more resources with them um, since you have started using OER? So I would say yes to both. Um, definitely, it's been easier for me to share with my colleagues uh, using OER and especially with online materials. Um, one of the most pressing questions for me after having taught a course in which I implemented these units, these problem-based units that I developed, was that I, I did notice that my students grew in their ability to work collaboratively to solve significant problems and that they, I think, grew in terms of their ability to do more independent research. But the challenge uh, for me, and this is more of a, the instructional method than it is the OER, um, was that I was sort of had less access to um, sort of individual writing and research skills because students were working collaboratively in small teams. I was not able to gauge quite as well individual uh, progress in writing and um, and speaking. So that's one thing that, as a result of that course, that I'm thinking about more and and wondering about. To also, but also talking to my colleagues about and. I have a feeling that we would be not talking about that as much had the uh, resources that I developed not been open. I think um, actually I spent the last year not teaching. I have spent my last year doing this uh, development project. So I'll be starting to teach with these OER materials or the materials we developed from them this week, and I'm really curious to see how the students are going to receive them. We do solicit feedback from instructors and from students uh, at the end of the session. Our sessions are eight weeks long, and we try to incorporate that feedback, but as far as feeling student engagement from a, you know, first-person perspective, I have not done that. Um, I'm looking forward to it. I really, really enjoy the process of creating my own things now that you know, I've had the experience of doing it. I feel it's empowering. It kind of gives me control over the way I want my, my classes to go. Um, yeah, I think it's been a great experience for me. I haven't used my, uh, my materials inside of the classroom. It was just a, not a class activity, but I plan to use them in the future, uh, probably for a unit. And being virtual reality, the, what I saw with the out of class activity, the students were very engaged and we were able to really explore the Italian culture from a different standpoint compared to what we traditionally do with the language textbook. Yeah, in my case, the answer is yes, both more engagement with the students and from my students and more engagement with colleagues because after writing a text, I invite other colleagues to read and uh, those feedbacks are are the perfect guiding, guiding lights that I am looking for to improve the, what I will offer to my students. So it gives me more engagement with my colleagues and also with the students. Um, students receive those readings with uh, a lot of excitement and it's just not that they are not buying, they don't have to pay for that, no, but it's also it's interesting, it's challenging, it's empowering, it's wow, it's, it's, it is what is happening right now. And right. wow, I, did, I was in Latin America for many years and I didn't know about this or that. And in a critical way, they, they analyze those readings and, and I can say uh, um, that they are more engaged. And uh, the numbers, the numbers of, uh, our uh, students uh, uh, registering in Spanish classes are increasing uh, because it's not just I am taking Spanish because I will finish, I will get a degree in Spanish, not necessarily because the topic is interesting and I want to know about that. That is my experience. Yeah, that makes me think about my experience when I taught an intermediate Italian course, the textbook we used was from 2013 and the readings in that were very outdated. They were talking about a workman that you will listen to music. I don't know if we use it in Italy, you put the CD in and you listen to music that way. And that's something that students today probably are not familiar with. And that reading was so 
outdated for them and we will we are instead we can really bring in texts that are current and that you know relate to student experiences and to their life today there's right. another question i'm sorry from uh from the chat um do you have any way of keeping track of who's and how your resources are used basically can you see the evolution of your work somehow so Carl, um, I'm going to answer some of this. Coral does keep track of of uh, how many hits um, we get for for a particular website, but beyond that, it is a little bit hard to see the evolution. We have tried we have tried to do that uh, for some projects, but it's hard to see, and and we are trying always to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, in particular, one of our projects, um, Flight, we're we're talking about. Um, seeing how what the process is, how uh, a lesson evolves over time. Um, but yeah, it's difficult because once it's out there, it's free, right? <laughs> it's, you know, but I don't know how the presenters um, experiences, experiences with that. If anybody has experience with the, your, your colleagues problem. using your lesson and then seeing how they their take is or how they're adapting something well our materials have, haven't gone out into the world yet so the experiences that I've had have been with the the uh, faculty that's using them in-house and they do develop and they do kind of evolve uh, we get feedback on things like content um, I wrote a chapter that included an article on slender man and everything <laughs> um, people were not a fan which is you know that's good that's the kind of feedback we need um, and so that was swapped out. Um, we have instructors who've used materials of other instructors and they've kind of reworked them to fit the style of teaching that they've got themselves. And so we do have several versions of things. And it is interesting to see how, you know, when you make something your own, how it, how it changes that, that mm -hmm. material. So. Mm -hmm. So there are different ways to answer this question. Uh, I just wanted to note that Galtini has written in and said, so um, are you talking about hits to the website? And just as Julie said, well, we don't have a website yet. <laughs> so um, you can do analytics, which are pretty easy to operationalize once you have a website up and going to see where the hits come from and you can see what country you're coming from. And that's just really fascinating to gather basic analytics on your on your materials because we were really surprised to find out when we published a website and a French website that people in France were using it anyhow. So I would encourage you to think a little bit about that. Um, maybe that it's a second stage later on once you have it up and running to think about uh, analytics. But um, we're also thinking about like at a mo more micro level as, as um, Natalie just said, a lesson can be used and repurposed in so many different ways. And that's even something you can do in-house because the whole concept of an OER empowers people to take risks and to, um, to uh, you know, adapt it in different ways. Whereas people often think I have to paint by the book, I have to stay close to the book. So you might, as you go forward, think about how other people are adapting your own materials because they're going to do it in so many different ways that you can't imagine. And it's the kind of the power of the crowd. Make sure that you can somehow collate that and figure that out. Thank you for those uh, guiding questions. I am taking notes because I have been happy just receiving emails from different colleagues saying that they are using the materials. And I was so happy just with that. But thank you for those guiding questions. Yeah. Yes, how? Well, that's, I mean, it's important just to feel good to get feedback from people, <laughs> but then you can also reach out and ask specifically okay. exactly how are they adapting it and changing it. Okay. That's the whole power of, of <laughs> OER. Exactly. And I see that we are coming up on the hour. We're already out of time. I knew that Q&A oh. would go quickly. And I want to draw people's attention to the, the chat, the group chat. People have posted really interesting comments and some good links here. Uh, somebody wrote in about the open textbook network. The, uh, there's a, a site in Min uh, University of Minnesota that's wonderful. Um, it's the open textbook library. Uh, those of you who've already developed OER um, and you're looking to, for ways to expand the reach of them, make sure that they are findable in a repository. So it's not a, 
you, it's great that you're sharing with the world, but you can turbocharge your sharing by making sure that they're somehow uh, reviewed and in these different repositories because that will go a long way. Talk to us if you want to make sure that um, we can put something up online for you. Before they go, we need to okay, so before you go, yes, I have a couple of things. I want to make sure that you all know about um, a project we have here at Coral called LEARN, uh, L-O-E-R Network. And the whole point is that people are doing all kinds of really cool stuff and uh, in the open education world, and we want to connect you with each other. So please come and visit that particular um, page on our website. It's called the Learn Community, and you'll get further connected. Uh, and you might just stumble across all kinds of people who are doing things very similar to what you're doing. We'll give you badges. We have micro-credentials for all the stuff that you're already doing. You can apply for it and get involved in that. I mentioned already our OER course. Have a ha, take a look at that because I think it could always there's always it's always a learning curve and we're always learning more new stuff. That's a great place. Um, we have activities and, and and it'll test your knowledge to see if you understand, let's say, the basics on on uh, licenses. And finally, of course, we have an OER hangout survey. Uh, this is everything that we do uh, comes from taxpayer money from the U.S. Department of Education. So we would really appreciate it if you take two minutes to, to take this survey. Uh, she's told you that the URL is right there, http uh, colon double slash bit dot ly slash two, et cetera. Okay, so take a minute to uh, do the Hangout survey. And I just wanna thank our pre presenters uh, and I want to thank not only you sharing your ideas with us, but just creating, taking that leap of faith to do OER. I think it's totally cool. Um, we are, I think, remaking education. And all of us have been talking about, well, uh, Sonia talked about social justice. I think social justice is at the heart of the OER movement. Yes. So it really is about making education open to everyone. And, you know, we're all educators. That's, that's the point, right? Okay, thank you all.